welcome to Gather, Scatter, Matter, uh, kind of our last installment of our vision series. Our vision continues to grow, but we're speaking, talking about this in the month of August. Lots of unique things. First off, gathering. It's getting in a large group like this that happens a couple of different times throughout Sunday morning. And then in all of our student and children environment, including middle school right now and then high school tonight, it's our large gathering space where we stir up one another to scatter. We take the next step, which is scattering. We talked a couple of weeks ago. We scatter into serving as well as we scatter into community groups, and we'll be talking about that today. Essentially, we went gather, scatter, matter, scatter, okay? Um, And last week, we talked about mattering. That's where we invest our lives at a level that deeply impacts the eternity of other people. So we sow in our time, treasure, and our talent so that we can make a difference. We can do something that has weight and mass to it. And so last week, we talked specifically about generosity, and we were given the opportunity to step into generosity by recognizing administrators and teachers throughout the valley. How many of you guys either got a Starbucks because you're a teacher or you told a teacher about it, but you were involved in that some way, some shape, some form? Okay, lots of people. It was super incredible. We had 50,000 people reached with that simple post. It got shared all throughout, lots of buzz going around about it, talking to baristas that were like, it was so cool to be able to hand that through the window and see it bright in a teacher's day. And so we're just very blessed to one, we, we have a desire to be known by what we're for. We have a desire to be known by our generosity. And we're for uh, teachers. We're blessed to meet in a school and to partner here. And so Uh, It's great to to be able to be part of that and see all those awesome things going on. So thank you for investing in that and for people who helped uh, to make all of that happen. As a church, we're gathering, scattering, and mattering, which is based out of our, we we feel called to love and lead one another, to be devoted followers of Jesus. It's work to scatter into community because it's natural to say, hey, I don't mind being anonymous in a gathering environment, but to take that step into community can be quite challenging but it's perfect along with, it's actually based out of Matthew 4, 19. Follow me, gather, I will make scatter, you fishers of men matter. And fishers of men is, I mean, think about that. It's, it's generosity and evangelism are just brothers. They're there together. It's like, hey, we've been given this, so we need to give this. It's kind of like, I'm gonna, I, I know how to fish, so I'm going to teach someone else to fish. I've been blessed with the grace of God. I'm going to share the grace of God. There's a generous heart behind it. The I will make is where we're going to live today. That's being formed and fashioned. I will make. We've been created in the image of God. God has a purpose for us. There, we've been fashioned in his image, but we've got to continue to grow into that image. So the creation is there, but the continual progress of discipleship to become more like God is the calling that we have on our life. What's awesome about today's message, and it's, it's unique that this whole year, everything has come down to one thing, and that's we felt called at the very beginning of the year that we were going to be united as one. That unity within the body, each person doing their part, was so important for this year, based out of Ephesians 4.1. I don't know if you remember, but we kind of canceled church on the 8th, and we were going to launch this vision and the idea, and it ended up being like a Facebook Live in my car in La Grand, Oregon. So, and we canceled church, so we didn't gather or scatter or even really matter that day. But we have a vision, and it's this. It's to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. That's what it's about. We're walking out life together. Worthy, meaning an honorable, you know, the, the good fruit of God at work in our life, Worthy of the manner that you've been called, that you all, every one of us in this room, we have been called. We've been set apart to do God's work. There's a purpose. I need you. You need me. No matter how much you think, you know, you may be able to do it on your own or whatever. Maybe if you're like, hey, well, you're an extrovert and I'm an introvert and we're just different and you're a guy, I'm a girl or whatever it is, you know, we can say, I don't really need people. I have my people as a body, as community. We need one another. And we're going to see how community lived out in the way that God would want community lived out can actually result in something great, even when a war is at stake. And so we're going to be in Joshua 22, if you'd like to turn there. We did a strong and courageous, strong for battle, and strong and devoted series um, earlier in the year, finished that up in July. If you missed it, I encourage you, it's an incredible series that we studied through all the different books, uh, chapters of Joshua. And chapter 22, I skipped. So those of you that have been, you have been tweaking out for like a month, 
tweaked out no longer, okay? Um, we're going to get there today. I saved it specifically around community because I knew that we were going to be in scattering, and I, I wanted to sh- save this for that time. But I want you to know it's not going to be an easy message. This isn't going to be easy scripture. These are difficult things. This is the sharpening that we're going to sharpen. The sharpening, we're going to sharpen uh, each other sharpeners, okay? So today is about community, friendship, accountability, and life together. You know your roots are in that? Your roots are in that. I'll get to Joshua, okay? I know, I know where this is going. Your roots are in that, and here's why. Because God is a relational God. Think about this. God said, hey, let there be light, and there was light. God said it was good. God said, let there be an eclipse, there was an eclipse. And he said, that's good too. Okay, that's not biblical. That just happened on Monday. But um, he said, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. And then he got to Adam and created him, and he said, it's not good for man to be alone. And all the ladies said, amen. You know, we know that for sure. I'm here to fix y'all. So, but he said, it's not good. Let me make a helper for him. Let me make not a completer because God is our completer. Male, female, God is our completer. There will never be someone else that completes you the way that God completes you. But let me give you a compliment. Let me give you a helper. Let me give someone alongside you. So that means this is relationships, that we would have relationship. I mean, relationship is the core of who God is. Think about this. Re- eternal relationships of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Trinity existing for all time. God himself has been an eternal relationship. Those are our roots as a people, whether you walk with God or don't walk with God, whether you consider yourself a Christian or a follower of Jesus or whatever, your roots as a human being created by God was for relationship. Introvert, extrovert, people person, not people person, tired, sleepy, happy, joyful, donut liker, whatever you are, there is a relationship desire that's inside of you that's been built inside of you. Those are your roots. Why not celebrate the roots? Why not drive into the roots of who you are instead of oftentimes we blame our roots? Well, I was raised this way. My parents were like this. My coach did this back in 1982. You know, I mean, we're looking back and saying, those are my roots. Were, I mean, blame it all on your roots. You showed up in boots to you ruined a black tie affair. I don't know what you did, but we're often blaming our roots rather than looking at them and say, we're and why, and what is the purpose of why I've been formed and fashioned by God? You are wired for relationship. And if anything can be heard of anything that I say today, it's a simple statement. Please don't stop at gathering. Please do not stop at gathering. If you stop at gathering, and you don't step into scattering and step into mattering, I just want you to know that Satan is, he's, he's cool. He wants you to be somewhat isolated. He wants you to be in a large room but still be anonymous. He wants you to have a lot of people around you but still feel alone. See, here's the thing about Satan. See, once you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, he can't touch your eternity because that's secure in the hands of God. But what he can do from there, he knows his eternal destination which is separate from all things that are good, which is eternally destined for hell and for destruction. So all he can do, he can't touch your eternity. He can steal your days and your minutes. He can isolate you. He wants to pull you apart from community and the pack of godliness and good things in life that community through Christ wants to be brought to you. So please do not stop at gathering. Before we go any further, I feel like as a body, we need to swear an oath. So would everybody raise their right hand? And I will wait till I see every hand. (laughs) So thank you, Brad. I was waiting. Okay. Hands up. Okay. We're good. Okay. We got some kids over here. Good. Right. That's your left. Just kidding. No, they would switch. That was actually your right. I'm totally joking. Okay. Raise your right hand. Here we go. I am a real stinking person. Okay. A little bit louder. How many of you guys have been to court? I know I have. So... (laughs) I am, a, I am a real stinking person, and I will not be satisfied with, you know, I could put a lot of different things in here, superficial relationships, okay, you can put your hands down, think about that, as a church, we have been called to be real stinking people, to be authentic in our relationships. We need to be completely dissatisfied with superficial relationships. 
to be fully known yet fully loved. That's God's love for us. And the love that, it, the Bible says that he first loved us, that love that he placed inside of us to fully know us, yet, know us yet fully love us, is the love that we're to share too. So this superficial, I'm going I'm to share the part of my life or the part of my persona or the part of the pie, this slice of me, so that people have a certain opinion of me. There's no place for that. That's to be partially loved, to be partially known, and to be fully empty. There's some temporary satisfaction with the approval of people when they know some of you, but when to be known and to be fully known, that's authenticity. That's where, that's the good seed that can multiply in your life. God wants to do that, but we have to open ourselves up to that. We need to seek out face-to-face -face relationships as a body. Not just, hey, we're friends, or we're friends, but face-to-face -face relationships, eye-to-eye. -eye. Taking the things that we hear about people and let's confirm it by what we see. Or let's say, well, let's not like allow gossip or this is what so-and-so said or this is what so-and-so said. I've heard people say things before and I know as a, as a fallen person, I've said things before that weren't accurate. And with godliness around us, those things can be corrected. And we're given an opportunity to press into relationships, the authenticity that lives there for us. Because friends become more like family. And families can restore. That's what God wants for us. But if we stay separate from this, we miss out on the fullness of what God wants. Part of me wants to just jump into Joshua 22 and get rolling with where we're going to be in the text. But I can't skip verse number five. Because verse number five, it's a statement of the kind of person that we should desire to be. The kind of person that God wants us to be and is calling us out to be. It's an instruction for a godly person and a blessed life. It says, only be careful. Only solamente. That's Spanish. Only be careful. <laughs> Sorry, last week was Italian. Um, but only. Of all the things you do, only focus on this. Be careful. Be very careful. That's like the words that we say to our kids like constantly. How many times do you say that? Please be careful. Hey, would you, would you please be careful? I really need you to be careful. Hey, I'm talking to you. This is important. I need you to be careful. This is a loving father saying, please be careful. Only. Not a bunch of different things, but specifically this. Be careful to do what? To observe the commandment. To pay attention. To prioritize to give your mind to the commandment and the law of Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you. Not highly suggested, not it would be a good idea, but you have been commanded. This is a word given to you that you would do this, you would what? You would love the Lord your God, to love, to walk, to walk in all of his ways. Remember, walk worthy of the calling that you've been given and to keep his commandments to cling to hold tight to him and to serve him with all of your heart with all of your soul see that's gather scatter matter gather together inspire one another for this scatter into relationships cling with those serve him when you serve him you're pouring out of your heart you're investing so your life makes a difference why because your entire heart your entire soul and your entire mind is sewn into the things that God wants for you. That's the kind of friend that we're looking for, and that's the kind of friend we need to aspire to be. See, when Joshua was given this calling to lead uh, God's chosen people, it was interesting because God told Joshua something, and Joshua was obedient and just did it. It wasn't perfect. There were some ups and downs. There were some lost battles. There was some sin. There were some situations of mistrust. But for the most part, Joshua got the instruction, and he simply did it. Well, it got to the point that they came in, they crossed the Jordan in a miraculous way. God parted the seas. They walked through it. They made a monument. They went and went city to city to city, took over the promised land, and now they're inhabiting this promised land. And there's 12 tribes. And now the tribes are dispersing throughout the nation. And two and a half of the tribes are going east side of the Jordan, 
and nine and a half are on the west side. You got east side, west side, okay? So they're split up a little bit. And there's some, this proximity, there's some distance between them. It's creating some struggle. But they're still one nation. They're still one body. They're just in a couple of different locations. And it's funny how they can go from fighting with one another and for one another to against one another. They just went through seven and a half years of battle together. And now Satan's going to spin it and say, hey, you've been fighting together. How about we fight one another? Something as simple as a few statements, something as simple as a little bit of gossip, it begins to spread. But really, because this group of people, this two and a half tribes that are on the other side of the river, they're protecting that area. They're sacrificing their lives. They're fighting and making sacrifice for their brothers and sisters, and now they're being accused of what we begin to read in verse 10. It says, And they came to the region of the Jordan that is in the land of Canaan. The people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by the Jordan, an altar of imposing size. So they built an altar. They built their own altar. And it was not a little altar. It was a large altar. And the people of Israel heard about this. And behold, the people of Reuben and the people of Gad, they said, and the house tribe of Manasseh, they've built this altar at the frontier, not just anywhere, but the frontier of the land of Canaan. In the region about the Jordan on the side that belongs to the people of Israel. And when the people of Israel heard it, the whole assembly, not some, the whole assembly of the people of Israel, they gathered at Shiloh to make war against them. This is a big rumor. Okay, it wasn't like some of the people and going, hey man, I know those people, man. We just spent like 40 years in the wilderness with them and seven and a half battling. I know them. It was like, dude, it's on. They're going against the Lord our God. We are going to go to battle in the name of God. They are righteously right, according to them. And so they start to make some assumptions about what has gone on. And they're assuming that this idol that has been built is a false idol. Why would they assume that? Because that's been the propensity propensity of this group of people for quite the period of time. To the point that even when they conquered one of the cities, someone took some of the idols and began to keep them back and they become more important. The things of the world became more important than the king of the world. And idol worship has slipped in before, so they're making this assumption that that's exactly what's happening, but not this time. No way. We will kill even our own people, our own family. See, how often do you hear something and you get mad about it before ever asking any questions? See, most of the time, we get mad when we need to get informed. I don't know if that is just me, but I am pretty horrible at asking questions because I make great assumptions. Why do I need to ask questions when I make great? Is anybody else out there a really great assumer? Like, you know, the scenario, the kids come in, they tell you something's going on. You're like, oh, I don't even know. I didn't know how this ends. I'm Sherlock Holmes. I know exactly what happened. This happened, this happened. You said this, you did this. You make those assumptions, and then you step away, and you're like, well, after they told their side, I guess my assumption wasn't quite as accurate as I thought. It was actually their fault. (laughs) Right? We got to ask more questions. They weren't asking questions. There was gossip. They were talking. Rather than talking to people, they were talking about them. And they're ready to go to war. They're ready to go to battle. How many of you guys, you can put together a really good argument in your mind and you have imaginary conversations and you're awesome. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, I'm going to say this. I'm going to burn them. I'm going to, I'll throw scripture in there. I'm going to Bible burn them. You know, like when, <laughs> hey, when he gets home from work, I'm going to say this and I'm going to say, what about this? And I'm going to Bible burn them too. I'm going to, like, we get this in our mind and we start thinking that, and it never really happens quite like that in the conversation, and then we forget what we were going to say, and it's awkward to have notes. Um, but, <laughs> but we think about this when, what if we talk to them? Because in verse 15, it has four simple words. I won't go into all that it says. It says, they said to them. They made a decision instead of like, hey, fire up the chariots, get the spears and the swords, and let's just go. They said, wait, let's talk to them. They said to them. Now, when they said to them, they did say their assumptions, and they did say what it looked like, but at least they had a conversation about it first. See, often we're more concerned about the friendship than we are the friend. We're more concerned, like, if I confront them, or if I inquire of them, or ask questions about them, it's going to hurt my friendship. We need to be concerned about the friend. 
Because we need that kind of friend. What about the toughest thing you've ever been through or the toughest crisis you've ever encountered or a decision that you made that cost you and your life and your family or your marriage a lot? What if someone was concerned about you as a friend, not just keeping your friendship intact? Because the marriage could be lost, but yay for your friendship. Yeah, you kept the friendship, but the marriage got lost because you didn't say anything and warn that friend because you were too busy trying to keep the friendship. I know that's harsh, but I know that that's true. And God may be giving you something and saying, hey, be that friend that you would like to have as well. But none of us like those conversations. None of us like to be called out. But think about that. Think about more than the friendship, think about the friend. Because the resolving conflict, it's, more, it's, it's less about being right and more about being reconciled. Think about that, resolving conflict. It's not about being right. Well, I'm trying to be righteous. Righteously right. And we justify ourselves in the way that we approach it. Because some of you are like, dude... This is a great message. I can't wait to confront about 15 people. I have so many problems with some people. I can't wait. This is just giving me license. I'm going to tell them to listen to this message, and that's why I've come to you. Because we can be wrong in that. The goal should be reconciliation. The goal should be restoration. The goal should be to grow more into the likeness of Christ. That's true friendship. That's honoring to God. Verse 16 says, And the whole congregation of the Lord said, What is this breach of faith that you have committed against the God of Israel? You have forsook our God. His hand of blessing is off of you, and now we are confronting you. He says they're in rebellion of the Lord. I mean, they are righteously right to do this according to their perception of what they see. For you have committed sin against the God of Israel and turning away this day from following the Lord by building yourselves an altar this day in rebellion against the Lord. You've rebelled. And on top of that, look at verse 20. It starts talking about Achan. Hey, here's another point as to why I'm right. You remember Achan? Achan had some idols and he hid him under his tent and we lost multiple people in a battle that we should have never lost against a weak city, but we lost people because of what Achan did. And now you're the next. You're the one that has fallen to the false gods. Let me bring some proof as to why I'm right. Because remember, Achan didn't perish alone. Many people did. And you know, that's what community is. Your sin and my sin affect each other. Your struggles, your shortcomings, your unconfessed, hidden life, my falling outs, my short, comings in my life. It, we all affect one another. It's, there's no isolation. That's what community is. There's a blessing for it, but there's also some struggle in it. But godly community calls that out and has grace for it, grace that we've all received that was undeserved. Paul says it this way. He wishes that there would be no division in the body. This is 1 Corinthians twelve twenty five. That there would be no divisions amongst the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. That we would have the same care. It's not a take relationship or a give only relationship. It's a relationship, it's a loving and leading, right? Let's love and lead one another. Let's edify one another. Let's encourage one another. That we'd have that same care towards each other. Notice it says one another again. 31 times in the Bible it mentions one another. This is a mutual commitment that we make to one another. And I know you probably didn't wake up this morning reciting this, but I will tell you that you need a barnacle buddy. You didn't look in the mirror and say, you know what I need? I need a barnacle buddy. Whose barnacle buddy are you? You probably didn't do that, okay? But let me explain this principle. Barnacles live... All over, but specifically barnacles, the barnacles I want to talk about live on Navy ships, okay? We have a picture of it that kind of shows you what I'm talking about. 
Barnacles attach themselves to the bottom of a ship, which does a lot of different things. I mean, it's not helpful at all. It creates a drag so that as a ship tries to go through the water, it'll cost it more fuel. But also, it costs a lot of money to remove these. The U.S. Navy alone spends $500 million a year removing and repairing boats from damage from barnacles. Barnacles will corrode away a boat, costing the boat to need to be repaired. Obviously, this lady that's got the squirt gun, the super cool job, um, but is removing the barnacles. Think about that. These barnacles, this boat that should be just the ship that should be going, it's got drag that's happening. But see, you look at it, it looks really good. Think about your life. If your life is a ship, you look at your life, it may look good. You're like the USS Awesome. You know, and you're like, hey, things look really good, but what about below the waterline? What about below the waterline? Do you have somebody in your life that can see some things that you can't see? That can help point out some problems that maybe you don't even know exist? Those drags in your life, those things that are slowing you down? Do you have anybody in your life that could do that? Are you looking, for any, are you looking to be that for someone? Because here's the deal. Apart from one another, apart from the one another's, we're isolated, and we can look real good. But what's under the water matters immensely, because ultimately your life will corrode. The ship will sink. Joshua and God's chosen people had to make a decision if they were going to have a conversation about something, or if they were just going to attack each other. There's decisions we make all the time about relationships. Real friendship. What is real friendship? A real friend is in the business of really getting into your business. A real friend's in the business of really getting into your business. See, as Joshua's calling out, I mean, they're saying, hey, we got to go check this out. What's going on? What if they would have chose not to get into their business and just made assumptions and a battle would have started? We're going to find out exactly what this altar is all about in a minute, but it took a conversation to even get there. Think about yourself as a real friend. See, when someone says, hey, how's it going? It's going good. That ain't your business. You're not letting them into your business. It's like, hey, it's going good. Hey, man, did you see the eclipse? Yeah, it was awesome. Did you wear glasses? No, I'm an idiot. Okay. You know, it's, it doesn't go very deep. And even when you're talking about your business, like talking about work and like, hey, it's going pretty good. I mean, it could be a little bit better. That's not the business that we're talking about here. We're talking about the depth of who you are, the emotions that you're feeling, the anger that is bent up inside of you, the discouragement, the depression that anxious spirit that you have. You need someone to share that with. You need someones to share that with. That's why we need community. You need a friend that loves you enough to make you mad. And you're like, I've dated plenty of people like that. (laughs) But you need a friend that loves you enough to make you mad. That they may say something, you're like, I do not agree with you at all. And an hour later, you still don't agree. And an hour and a half later, and two, and a week. Sometimes you recognize what they're calling out and trying to help you. Because iron sharpens iron. And so should one man sharpen the countenance of his friend. And the character of his friend. And the calling of his friend. See, the friends that you and I need when we're going through crisis... Guess when's a really bad time to try to get those friends? When you're going through crisis. It can happen. God can work a miracle and God will never leave us or forsake us. And he's a friend. The Bible says that a friend will lay down his life for a friend. A true friend. God has done that. So God is with you no matter what. But to prepare because our life will come crashing down. There will be crises that happen. Preparing your life in friendship, real friendship that prepares you for what could come. Not so that we're longing for those friendships once it's arrived. We're blessed to have community groups here. 
And I know when I speak of community groups, there are people that talk about small groups and they've been in different experiences or, or maybe you've been in a group and it didn't connect at this turbo deep level and it wasn't like best friends forever, kumbaya, handshakes, and you've got it all figured out. Maybe it's just been, you know, a season and there's been some challenge in it. And every time I talk about community groups, I know that there are people that are like, hey, you know, I just haven't really found that yet. I've tried, but it's not there. I just want you to know that I've thought about this multiple times in my life. Like, I need to be the community that I'm looking for. Like, I can't wait for it to come to me and be like, community, come to me. Community, relationships, I need this. This one, God, would you, God has not given me this yet, and I'm frustrated, and where, where are you at, God? I need this community. You know I need this community. I have to take the step to be the community that I'm looking for. And God will bring that through my step in scattering, my step in making a difference in the life of another person. So when you see the community group insert that you get, it's, it's more than just a bunch of names and times and, and different things like that. I mean, this fall, we get the opportunity to study through Galatians together that we're going to start even with a little bit about the man, Paul, who God set apart, did an amazing work through. We're going to talk about him next week and then move into the book of Galatians. Then we're doing a marriage and family series, as well as talking about singleness and some of that later in October and then the life of Elisha. It's just incredible. It's a deeper environment to talk about God and and maybe even a weekend message or some other study. Um, But it's true life change. And there were a couple of people that, that shared with us come, some of their experience that God blessed them with. One couple says, last year, right before my family and I started going to Rock Harbor, we felt this heavy burden to be part of a church that was in the city in which we lived. Even though Boise was just a short commute from Meridian, we felt called to attend, pray for, give, and serve at the church that would be our neighbor in our zip code with our community. I love that. They just basically said, gather, scatter, matter. They should have put it. It'd be more powerful, but whatever. Um, They said, pray for, give, serve, be our neighbor. It didn't take us long for us to get swept off our feet by the people of Rock Harbor, Uh, the worship, the teaching, the heart behind Rock Harbor. For the first time ever, we were not (laughs) called out of service to go pick up our crying kids. For the first time, our kids felt loved and served. I really think they started to experience community for the first time. That's awesome. We want to thank Miss Debbie in the threes and fours class. She deserves a raise. <laughs> Debbie's a volunteer. She can have, Debbie can have some more hand sanitizer for all I care. Um, <laughs> thanks, Debbie. Um, keep serving the Lord. Keep scattering and mattering. So from then on, going to church on Sundays became less of a burden and more of a desire. Week after week, we felt so ministered to at the services, but yet we still felt like a small fish in a big pond. There were so many people that we'd love to meet, but kind of like a new kid at school, we felt shy to take that vulnerable step forward. Everything changed one day when we accepted the invitation to meet someone at the tent. After the service, little did we know that our life would never be the same. We were introduced to one couple, and we were quickly sucked into this community group that became family to us. That's a spiritual gift, okay? (laughs) These people welcomed us into their homes. They shared their meals with us. They made us feel so welcome and invited us to be part of something bigger than a small group. They invited us into one of the best friendships my wife and I have ever experienced. We started doing everything together from sitting in the service together to eating out after church and even doing volunteer work together. Our community group became more than a small group. It became our church. Amen. Another one shared this. Last year, our family felt prompted to check out Rock Harbor. We've had some bad church experience in our past, and these have hurt us very deeply. Needless to say, we were hesitant to get involved. But from the beginning of our time at Rock Harbor, we found out that we were among people who not only called themselves real stinking, but they actually built authentic relationships. I was excited to find the same genuine spirit when I joined a women's community group last winter. Our our leader created a safe and inviting space where women could be known and be cared for. It took time to intentionally build relationships, but as they were fostered, people were able to support each other with a focus of drawing closer to Jesus. It quickly became evident how crucial community groups are to the mission of Rock Harbor, especially within loving and leading. I felt called to become a community group leader myself in order to help create more space for more women to get more connected and to grow more together. I can't wait to see how God moves next. 
to say to go from, hey, I'm attending to, hey, I want to serve. I want to sow into the mattering. I want to do whatever I can to pour into the lives of people. And as you look at this logo behind me, we strategically put these three dots behind community groups, meaning there's a conversation to be had. There's more to come, the dot, dot, dot. You see that in a text message. You see that as someone's responding to your message, that little flash down there that there's something's coming. Just to know that it continues. Community continues. It multiplies. It begins with something. It begins with that step of faith to scatter, and it multiplies into something more. And I know every story isn't totally perfect, and maybe you've had a difficult experience, and you put yourself out there in relationships, and you're just not sure exactly what to do. I would just encourage you. When you look at scripture, you look at that Joshua 22, 5, we need to step into. The Bible's very clear when it says to stir one another up into good works. The one another's are mentioned over and over and over again. We have to press into those things. There's not easy, but it's difficult. Relationships are challenging. I mean, the children of Israel are just like us. It was challenging. There was some distance between the groups of people. There was, there was a lack of proximity. A lack of proximity can polarize. Distance can demonize. That's really good. Like I worked on that for like four hours, okay? But distance can demonize. Think about that in your relationship. You're around people less, you start to have thoughts in your mind. So guess what those two and a half tribes did as they were accused of these things? They said this. If we have done this in any way, any shape, or any form, the wrath of God needs to come down upon us, for we want to serve the Lord our God. Verse 21 through 24, it says, We built that altar in remembrance of the one true altar. We built that. That's just a replica. But guess what? We're raising our kids, and when my kids hang out with your kids... We want our kids to have the same focus. See, you get this because of proximity. This is here. We are building this so our kids can look and they can know the one true God because they didn't get across the Jordan like you did. And my kids didn't get to watch the walls of Jericho fall down. But because of this altar and the remembrance that's there, we can say, look at what God did. So our kids can be in unity. You know, it's one of the greatest gifts I've been given in my life. Because when I was born, my parents were not walking with Jesus. But they got connected and they gathered with a group of people. All because they wanted to play co-ed volleyball. And they gathered with a group of people and they had awkward sweatpants on. And they decided to play church volleyball at the YMCA against all the other churches. Which is, that'll test your belief in God. Okay? (laughs) But they decided to do that. Next thing you know, they found community. They have great relationships and great friends. And I am a product of them getting together and talking to each other about whose kids were worse, which was accurate and true. But they walked through it together. And they lived life together. And they took that step. And now guess what? I get the privilege of doing that. I also get the responsibility of that. Because it's not easy, and it's not perfect, and every group isn't going to be happily ever after Kumbaya Brady Bunch, okay? It's not always going to be just like that. Life's a mess. But people are worth it. And if you get the opportunity to be that friend on this side of crisis, praise the Lord for that. Community. What a gift. Don't just gather. Do you know what the words were from the nine and a half that were making some accusations before? Do you think when they returned back and they heard, well, okay, that was a good altar. What once was a wedge was now an alignment. And they didn't go back. They went back maybe learning a lesson about gossip and learning a lesson about jumping to conclusions, but they went back celebrating that they were united as one. Because, hey, what used to be, what used to be bad in their ears turned out to be really good in their eyes. And verse 31 says that it was good in their eyes. Think about that. What Satan can come into your ears and tell you who he wants you to believe that you are, 
Once you step away from that and you push into community, it can be good in the eyes. Satan wants us to believe something and hear something that is not accurate, that's not true. But when confirmed by community and people around you to say, you are not crazy. You are a child of the king and I am with you and I'm in this with you. What was once not so good in your ears can be so very good in your eyes. And that's what community brings to us. We get the opportunity today to not just talk about community, but to receive communion. Here's what I struggle with communion. I'm just going to be honest with you. Is that people see it and they receive it like it's a church activity. It's like, that's what we do. We do that every week. We do that every six weeks. We do that every four weeks. And we just think, hey, that's what I do as a follower of Jesus. Or people that aren't even walking with God are like, everybody else is doing this, so I probably should do this too. Wow, that bread's weird. I mean, that's literally like thoughts that come through all of our heads. You know what it is? It's a remembrance of what has been graciously done for us. How can we receive the forgiveness of God yet not forgive others? And for some in here, as you receive communion today, you're going to receive so for the first time as a follower of Jesus. Believing that his body was broken for you and his blood was spilled out. But he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead, conquered sin, conquered death, and is alive. You were made in his image and now he's drawing you to him. And you're going to seek forgiveness of your sins and receive communion as a follower of Jesus. And here's why. Because you were not saved as a community. You were saved into community. So no matter what relationship your parents have with God, no matter what relationship your kids have with God or your grandparents or godly people around you, You and I still give a personal account of our communion, our community with God. So we don't ride on the coattails of someone else's decision. And in fact, a church, maybe tradition or ordinance of communion does not save you. Follow me means you're saying, I surrender my life to Jesus Christ. Please save me. So I receive communion knowing that I've accepted that gift of salvation. Here's the hard part. There are some of you in here that are walking with Jesus and you follow him as your savior. And there may be some that as the plate is passed because they have not surrendered their life to Christ, they may just pass it. Don't take it because everybody else is. Maybe you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus. Don't take something as a show of hey, it's what everybody else is doing. But there's also people that are going to let that pass in front of them. They have a relationship with Jesus, but they shouldn't receive it because they have a conflict with a brother. These are hard words, but these are words of the Bible. We don't like to talk about that because we want to sing a happy song. We want everybody clapping. We want everybody laughing, everybody feeling good. But the Bible is very clear. Communion is a gift that's been given and we need to receive it in the right heart. So for some, it's confessing sin, but if that sin is one that is against a brother and there is strife that is there, I would encourage you to take those steps to resolve in your heart. And if God tells you right now to just wait and to have a conversation, that, my friend, is a gift. And that reflects the grace and forgiveness of God. And that's what it means to be in communion and in community with one another. God, we are grateful for the gift that's been given to us and salvation, the one of conversation that we can talk out challenges in our life with brothers. For those of us that need to step up in our relationship, need to confess sin to one another, maybe it's to receive you as our Savior this morning and celebrate in communion this new life that's come in you. God, we know you receive us. You are not far from us. You are with us. Today, God, we pray that you would be in us, receiving you as our Savior and also confessing and receiving the grace that's been poured out for us. We ask this in your name. Amen.